Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone from around the world. It is a great honor and a pleasure for me to be able to present this discussion, assessing the venous thromboembolism risk in the hospital and beyond. And I'm greatly indebted to the Sanofi Corporation for its undying efforts uh, to promote education around the world. And I'm proud to be a part of that initiative to help spread the word. You know, we are trying to prevent the number one preventable cause of death after surgery, which is a fatal pulmonary embolism. On this title slide, you see the largest study ever done with the Caprini score, and we will describe that in detail later. It's a very powerful statement from, uh, from the Asian world regarding thrombosis risk assessment. Here are my disclosures. Now, I, I know it'll come as no surprise that I've picked the Caprini score to talk about uh, scoring, but the reason is it's the most comprehensive history and physical regarding uh, evaluation of a patient for surgery. And of course, the more questions you ask, the more information you find out about your patient, the safer it is for you to be able to take care of that patient. The Caprini score is nothing more than a history and physical that consists of 40 elements. And we know as the number of risk factors increases, the risk of thrombosis goes up. We also know that the risk factors have different powers. Some risk factors are low power, such as bed rest, and some are very high power, such as pancreatic cancer or history of thrombosis. So combining those powers with the number of risk factors can, we have come up with a simple number called the score. And the score is a nonlinear representation compared to the incidence of thrombosis. So as the score goes up, one, two, three, four, five, and so forth, the risk of thrombosis goes up. And you can see in that introductory slide from Vietnam how important that was as the number of risk factors goes up. Here's an example from general surgery, and you can see the relationship here. Note that once you get over eight, the risk gets very high. Now, as far as surgical patients goes, five original studies were used to calculate the highest risk set point for VTE in the 2012 guidelines. Now, currently, uh, there are 194 studies as of the end of the year. There's several more come out in 2021 already. And these studies demonstrated the rela direct relationship between the score and the VTE incidence. The data show that not all those with a score of five are at high risk. Some surgical studies, a score of five is associated with a low risk and that, that is not further reduced using anticoagulants. This has been very sh nicely shown in a meta-analysis. Worldwide studies have identified that very high risk scores for VTE patients may vary according to the surgical population. Head and neck surgery, very low incidence of DVT until you hit six, seven, or eight then it jumps dramatically. I don't understand, and I've been w trying for the last year since these guidelines to come out, why in the 2019 guidelines directing all of us, and we all love to follow the guidelines because we look at that as the most authoritative source that's been arbitrated by experts, they only have one study in there from the Caprini score. The other 194 are missing, including the very important meta-analysis. And, and, and these are the important elements. In 2012, Chess said that a score of five and above was high risk. Well, now we know that's not true. Take a look in general surgery. Once you get over, the score of five is a little over 1%. But when it goes uh, to eight and above, it's six and a half percent. In head and neck surgery, look at this. There are no clots. Three to four, four to five, less than 1%. But once it hits nine and above, 18%. Very important here, what's happening past the five. And it's important for clinicians to know since 2012 what we have learned and to pass it on to the folks around the world. There are 5 million patients in clinical trials using this, and doctors from all over the world use it. And the reason they use it is it picks out those people at low risk that don't need prophylaxis, those people at risk that need prophylaxis, and those people that may need even prolonged prophylaxis. Look at this in plastic surgery, very low incidence. Uh, Caprini 5 to 6, 1.3%. Again, 
1.3 percent in the in the in the general surgery study. Look what happens when they get eight and above. 11 percent at 60 days in plastic surgery. And here's the results from intensive care. Pretty linear relationship. Take a look at these results from Kirill Lobostov uh, from from Moscow. A very uh, brilliant young investigator. And they did duplex scans in very high risk, complicated surgical patients, and noted that when the score of, of was um, from five to eight, only one person had a scan positive clot, but and a quarter of them had it from nine to eleven. But look what happens when you get to twelve. Sixty five percent of this particular population had a clot on duplex scan. Set points, very important. And now we come to the single biggest study ever done in the world regarding uh, the risk assessment for uh, hospitals from Vietnam, from the Hanoi region. Uh, took a look at 2,795,000 patients, and they showed the same identical things. Caprini 5 to 6, 1.9. But then the, the score goes above 8, 4.5%. And people says, yo, you know, sometimes can you trust results from other parts of the world and so forth? These results exactly mirror what is seen in all of the other graphs that I'm showing you from all around the world. It's very simple. A thorough history and physical, when properly done, will yield important information and pick out those people at high risk from clots and also pick out the people that you don't need to give anticoagulants to because their risk is low. Here we go to China now, and this is a, a study in Burns, and you can see 0.78 of a percent with a five to six score. When the score gets up to a, a greater than eight, it goes up to almost nine percent. And that's why I have to I, I have to say again is I'm very disappointed with the Ash Guidelines Committee for not acknowledging that since 2012, when Chess said the score of five and above was high risk, not to acknowledge all of this beautiful data from all of these wonderful, careful investigators from around the world since that time. Now, we know it's hard to collect this data, so there's a patient-friendly form, which um, many people have put together in various languages, and it's a very simple form that patients can fill out. I would draw your attention to two things. The first thing is the the, the women's section, which uh, indicates those, those patients that... Uh, have a history, an obstetrical history of obstetrical complications. And in those patients, they may carry the antiphosphate antibody syndrome, which is a very powerful predictor of thrombosis, and they may carry that through their life. So it's important to know that history. The other thing that's important is family history of thrombosis, the most single, most frequently missed thrombosis factor. Some of the risk assessment schemes have thrombophilia uh, history there, but that's not, that's not very uh, germane because most people don't uh, do thrombophilia testing. It's very expensive. It's not done around the world. And 90% of people that develop a clot don't have a marker that we can identify. So we have to know about family history. That's really key. And so this obstetrical history coming back to this is that these events may signal a, the presence of one or more hematologic abnormalities the patient may carry through their life and may indicate a high risk of thrombosis. You can see the escalating risk, whether one, two, or three of the abnormalities are present. Now let's take a look at family history. Here's another article that has been, has been lost in the shuffle. This comes from Scandinavia. It's 183,000 patients over a 25-year period with match controls. And you can see that the incidence of venous thrombosis is increased in a patient who doesn't have a clot, but has a family history. First, second, third degree relatives, it goes down. And also people that live with one another, married and, and, and uh, people that live together and so on and so forth, partners for life. Uh, and and the, sometimes they may have an increased risk of thrombosis because, of course, they may have similar lifestyles. The other thing that's absolutely critical and not understood and the authorities should have pointed out for us is that the Caprini score needs to be revised during hospital stay. Sometimes a person will come in with a simple appendix, be operated on and afterwards has a leak and have to be reoperated to drain the leak and then with the infection needs a central line and maybe then because of that the wound falls apart so they're non-ambulatory and maybe they also get pneumonia. And if we have a similar case like that, 
uh, it's not that original score that was low. It's all those things that happened during hospitalization. And now because of that, the patient may need prophylaxis uh, because the updated score will often result in a change in thrombosis prophylaxis, including the very important time of post-discharge prophylaxis. So the Caprini is a dynamic tool. Now, we know that over 100 years ago, uh, Virchow put together the three postulates that were responsible uh, when they, uh, for producing a venous thrombosis, vessel wall injury, hypercoagulability, and stasis. And I would submit to you that the following description of what happens to a surgical patient under anesthesia is in a microcosm, a witch's brew, a Virchow's triad, where all of these factors come together and make it very likely that a clot will develop. First of all, the effects of anesthesia due to venous stasis because the muscle calf, calf muscles are paralyzed so the veins dilate. As they dilate and overdistend and endothelial cracks occur, hypercoagulability occurs, occur, uh, secondary to surgical stress, retained metabolites and underlying pathology that the patient may come to the operating room table with. For example, a COVID-19 infection or a cancer. And don't forget, even though the patient's under anesthesia, those muscles are metabolizing. And those metabolites are now sitting in this witch's brew because they're not getting pumped out of the leg. Time of anesthesia intensifies these effects. A simple operative procedure from the surgical standpoint that takes two or three hours may be a tremendously high risk uh, uh, procedure from the thrombosis risk uh, standpoint. And it makes it absolutely mandatory that intermittent pneumatic compression is used during this operative period to minimize these changes. Those people that are wanting to get rid of intermittent pneumatic compression better pay careful attention to this pathophysiologic discussion. And here is a one, one million power micrograph from another brilliant surgeon, Tony Camerata, and he and his researchers in an experiment showed that when anesthesia occurs, there's a venous dilatation and you can see there are cracks in the endothelium here. And in those cracks, blood clots can form. And here we see a, a model uh, of a white cell that turns into a, an a adhesion molecule because the blood flow is slowing down. And that's why you see the background getting bluer. And then these adhesion molecules actually settle on the endothelium. They stop and then they extrude their granules, creating an inflammatory response. And that inflammatory response ruins the wall of the endothelium. And of course, other White cells come along and turn into adhesion molecules, and the thing, same thing happens. So now this endothelial lining can no longer function normally. And here we see a, a picture of it from the actual experiment. And here you can see an adhe adhesion molecule ready to penetrate the endothelium. So it's very important that one take a look at all of these risk factors for production of thrombosis during the surgical procedure. Now, let's talk about bed rest. It's a well-known risk factor. And people have forgotten about the famous Metanox trial that was done over 20 years ago in which they were comparing patients who got, these were medical patients at risk, and they either were treated according to the standard of the day, which was no prophylaxis, or they received a dose of, they received a low molecular weight heparin during their hospitalization. And the, uh, uh, the results compared low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis group to those in the control group. And the, uh, uh, the, the, the trial was highly successful, but they went one step further. They made a definition of ambulation, the ability to walk 30 feet. And so if you couldn't walk 30 feet and you were in the control group, so you didn't get anticoagulants, your risk was almost 20%. But if you could walk 30 feet, even without anticoagulants, it was cut in half to 10%. Now, in those patients in the low molecular weight heparin group, as you can see, 9% incidence of venous thrombosis compared to 19%, very highly successful. But what's really important is if those patients could ambulate, the risk was lowered to 3.3%. And that, that definition of ambulation wasn't going to the bathroom or sitting in the chair five feet from the bed. It was walking 30 feet using both legs. And despite the fact the timely mobilization of these patients who become ambulatory still have a significant risk reduction with low molecular weight heparin. Therefore, it's essential that ambulatory patients receive the recommended prophylaxis. And, and I would just like
to point out that it's it's very very critical just because a patient gets up and they can ambulate 30 feet that you don't say we can stop the prophylaxis because those people still may have cancer, a history of thrombosis, inflammatory bowel disease or other comorbidities and they still need prophylaxis. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, the Caprini set the Caprini score is a set point for high and highest risk and it varies according to the population study. We know in very low risk uh, patient groups such as head and neck surgery, if a score of five, almost nobody gets a clot. Whereas if the score is over eight, 11 to 18 percent get a clot. The same thing holds true in uh, the famous meta-analysis that was done by Panucci that showed that those people with a score of less than seven, there was no benefit to giving those patients in anticoagulation. It did not lower their VTE risk. But if the patient had a score of eight or above, and wasn't given prophylaxis, then their incidence of blood clots would be 10%. So very important to know the set points. We also have shown you the set points from Vietnam, from China, and from uh, uh, Russia, and they all show the same thing. It depends on the population that is studied. It's very, very important for you to collect the Caprini risk scores uh, uh, assisted by your loved ones. And what we suggest is that everyone, once they listen to this lecture, go and do their score. You can get it online on YouTube, on a, my website. Do the score and share it with your doctor and get a number put in your chart so that if you get sick, if you, let's say you come into the hospital with a serious COVID illness and people are trying to save your life, they're not going to ask you 40 questions and whether your grandmother had a DVT. You've got to have that information in the record or it'll get missed. And I promise you that most of the time family history gets missed. And the other thing is that it's very important that if you have a stroke, if you're in an auto accident, the same thing is true. Remember that the score is a dynamic instrument and must be scored on initial hospitalization and then must be scored during hospitalization and at discharge. I would uh, caution everybody, the only people that should do risk assessment, aside from the patient friendly, correlated with their doctor ahead of time, is people that do a history and physical. To have the same day surgery nurse in the holding area before surgery trying to do a 40 question interview is totally inappropriate. The same thing holds true with somebody coming in for a COVID uh, illness. There's no time to do this. However, I would like to point out that everything we've learned prior to COVID, and now that the authorities really agree that we need to use individual risk assessment, all of these trials in COVID patients, they're not doing individual risk assessment. So the value of these trials are limited because you're putting everybody in the same bucket, and that never has been shown to work in the past. Remember also that thrombosis risk assessment is related to anesthesia time rather than to the surgical procedure alone. And so, therefore, a simple procedure, for example, if somebody's doing an arthroscopic procedure and maybe trying to do a root repair, which takes a couple of hours, that's a low-risk procedure from the surgical standpoint, but not from the anesthesia standpoint. Two hours of anesthesia, it makes it very high risk for thrombosis. And failure to track obstetrical complications or family history of thrombosis may result in a serious VTE event in the patient. And remember this famous saying, this was given to me by a, a, a academic dentist from Maine. And performing a history and physical gives you knowledge about your patient as if they were a good friend. And of course, you would never kill a friend and you would never treat a stranger. Please visit my YouTube channel at Venus Resource Center or my website at venusdisease.com, which is shortly to be updated. Thank you very much for the privilege of presenting these data. And I hope everyone has a great day and stay safe. Thank you very much.